Um, yeah, so great. Actually, thank you for um, for the opportunity to speak with you. Good is actually now the stage is set that everybody, I think, you said level seven is now achieved to understand open banking. Uh, I, I would summarize after this meet, um, this talk is now from IDC is, I think you never achieve 10. Yeah? So it's really about like, um, always when you talk about open banking, you will always learn something new. Yeah? So, and you will get a couple of things from my side where you will give a new perspective because there is no one definition of open banking. Yeah? So we are still on the journey and I will give you now, especially from our bank side, where we are in this journey, where we are learning and where we are going there. So I would never claim to make this now at the beginning, we have a robust framework. No, we are not there yet. So, but we are on a very committed roadmap. So first of all, maybe Standard Charter is not for everybody known. So it's like, yes, we are a quite big bank. So it's a global bank. We have corporate business. We have retail, private and wealth. We have actually the whole complexity what a bank can have. We are operating in 60 countries, primarily Africa, Middle East, uh, Asia. So and um, in that sense, you know, where is the Standard Charter unique? Yes, so it's if you compare to, to other much, much bigger banks than us, but it's like we are in many very unique markets. And we are actually the only one bank in the world, if you are taking now from a population perspective, the top from the top 10 countries, looking the um, eight out of them, we have a banking license then. So then you can imagine now, when you're going very disruptive new models, how you can really grow with new models in uh, to reach out this new customer. So that's now a bit like the discussion where I will go there. Africa, I will touch. Yes, so Africa, we, are, we really fully um, uh, went into this market with digital banks, fully, um, you know, digitalized, no branch at all. Everything is uh, mobile based. And uh, in that sense, we, we have done a lot. So this year we have now eight countries there. Um, and this Nigeria, Ghana and all of that, you can imagine many, many things are leapfrogging technology. And that's a point where I'm quite proud in uh, being in this bank. It's like we are not, you know, seeing open banking as an, a threat where most other banks are really struggling with this discussion about, oh, do I capitalize my current business or should I really go there inside? So if you go in markets like Africa and so on, that's the way to be there. Yes. So, and now coming also a bit like to the definition of open banking to, to explain this a bit where it's also a massive culture change inside a bank. Yes. So, Traditionally, you have seen we have now a history of more, more than 150 years. And yes, 150 years ago, we were just branches. Yes? So, and more physically, actually, customers has to go physically to bank to make banking. Yes? So, but we are still, as today, even sometimes when people try to talk about open banking, the misunderstanding is like the mindset is still um, I will summarize it as a mobile first architecture. Yes? So it's more like, oh, I still have to go digitally to a bank to make banking. So, and that's now the difference between an API first architecture compared to a mobile first architecture. Yes? So if I still have then an app, and this is now my app, where now the customers have to come there to make actually banking, then it's not open banking. Yeah, so that's now open banking is starting with the thinking about banking is going to the customer, not customers are going to banking. Yeah, so, and with that definition, where I go a bit um, beyond of the definition from IDC is like, yes, data is important, but in open banking, I put in the scope as well as transaction. So, because just imagine about the transaction in corporate banking. We are one of the leading banks with trade, trade financing and all of that. How we make it more transparent. How we are going there in, in a sense to create more trust. So um, transactions is part of open banking as well as an algorithm. So algorithm is in a sense, you know, when you think about uh, going insurance and so on, how we are really getting in a really more open fashion. Um, and my favorite um, example is like in bank insurance is like 
when you want to finance your car. Yes? So you are going to the bank, that's the first need, and then this our process, we are scoring you, we are giving you a kind of you know, dependence on the scores and a loan and all of this. But the next thing from a customer journey, you're going to the insurance, and they will do exactly the same with a different algorithm about how they will score you to give you then an insurance fee. So why you not package that? Why you not share the data? Why you not bring this together? The customer is getting, depending on how they get the, the loan scoring, also then the, the insurance scoring. Yes? And this getting, in a sense, where I see open banking will go across different industry very different way. Yes, so that's now where we are starting from, from the thinking. Um, I, I will speed up a bit with that because yes, you have seen a lot of things happening in the market. Yes, so a lot of regulator are coming, regulator are defining, okay, how we should govern, what kind of APIs are there, uh, you know, UK with CSD2 and so on. Uh, is this relevant? Yes, in, is this relevant? Actually, you know, still be frank from a banking perspective. This is how we still work with our investments. If a regulator is saying we should do this, then we have money to do this. Yes, so it's much easier to to uh, to go with that approach instead of going with a very different value proposition to say, okay, beyond of the regulator is saying how we want to define open banking beyond of the open APIs. And that's a, a different conversation and discussion. Yes, so, but to give you now the perspective, what does it mean, open banking, and where we are today, and really not to see this just as a threat, but the next slide will give you this a kind of an impression, also to see this as, as an opportunity because the market is very dynamic now happening. Yes, so I take you the example, payment. Payment is the core functionality of a bank. Yes, so that's defined at the beginning, what is a bank? You can make payments. But what happens now in payment? Yes, what happens there with all the possibilities with APIs and also the customer demands and needs because they want to have more choices. That's the definition of open banking. Yes, so it's like if I'm going this uh, six pillars there, then you know, really about e-commerce. Yes, so one of the best examples what I see in the market is when you go about Stripe. Yes, so Look how, how they are working with APIs. How they make payment in e-commerce very different. Yes, so how they enable a developer ec a economy all around this API. So that's one thing what is changing a lot, how you want to make payment in e-commerce. Yes, so on the other side, we have also the discussion about P2P payment. Yes, so two big things. If you are here in Singapore, you know pay now. Yes, so now you can make mobile to mobile payment. It's from a regulator, UPI in India, very famous. Yes, so all of this is, um, you know, coming there. How payment is changing. The the other thing is about like uh, I talked uh, about this um, telco. There was the, the question about there. What are telco doing? Yes, a lot of telco industries are already massively thinking about a wallet. Yes, so it's not just that Apple and Samsung and. Google are doing this, now also the telco industry is going there. So how they make an Apple Pay, how they are going there, and look what is Apple Pay doing now. They are doing a credit card, it's the next one. Yeah? So it's like how this wallet payment is going the whole journey. Yeah? So it, it's like you know, Alipay is very strong there coming and more and more is coming. So um, as you see all these examples, uh, the, the other thing about like, um, you know, when you take from China especially, how many people in China are paying really with a credit card? Yeah, so um, actually, when you go to the social network platforms, that's now this, uh, this discussion there. Where's WeChat? WeChat is doing already. Yeah? So we are actually the only one non-Chinese bank in uh, China who we have enabled our payment API to get it integrated in WeChat. So, is it now a new opportunity? Exactly, this is now the whole journey in that. So you make now exactly in the in your chat, then also the payment. Yes, when I'm talking with some friends about, oh, I want to go to the cinema, why not make now exactly at that point, now the payment to get the tickets instead of going now to, to a different app and making now some reservations, etc. So that's the journey with the whole socializing. So, and you know, the other thing what you see also, especially here in, um, in Singapore also, for example, this, um, um, you know, that you not need to go anymore to, to an ATM to get money. So how, how so cash is now changing that you can go to a retail and many things are helping you in this journey. So 
to, to keep it short, is like, as you see now, this is kind of new ways, if you open up APIs, many, many new models, what were never be possible before, are now happening in the market. So, and can any bank avoid that? No. Yeah, so, and now the point is more, instead of saying that, oh no, we don't want to be part of this, it's exactly now the journey how to make, even in all these new choices, all these new ways, how payment is changing and so on, also exactly the value proposition for the bank. That's the journey there. So, uh, to make now here also a an, an, an discussion what makes it really, as I said at the beginning, a mobile-first architecture is not open banking. Now, an API-first architecture, that's an enabler to open banking. Um, and, but we have to go farther. And that's now where the banks are really get stretched. And so it's like, if you go back in the history, yes, yeah, so very traditional, then we were very much product driven. Yeah? So this is a product, actually similar to manufacturers, they're building it, there's a stock, you sell it, you can't customize it, that's it. Product oriented. Yeah? So, and on this journey, when we got more and more, you know, on the way, we want to be customer oriented. Yeah? So, you know, in the 90s, we, we introduced it then different channels, web, mobile, you know, that you not anymore have just to go to the, to the branch, but it's still, you know, very limited in each of this channel. And uh, by, the uh, by the way, also very siloed. If you have a call center, and then on the other side, you have an issue with your app, usually sharing the data of all of that, it's always a challenge. Yeah? So, but going into this, yes, client-centric, I will say, this is where we are today. The next thing is like, really, open banking means I have to give away control, what is very, very hard for a bank. Very, very hard, because we are regulated. Yes, we have to govern all of that and giving away control. So because today, the advantage is even if we are saying we have a mobile app, the mobile app is developed by us. We have still full control how our apps are consuming our APIs. So we still have control on the consumption of the APIs we are producing. But now if you are going a, a journey in opening it up and giving now the APIs to others to consume, then we have less control how they can consume it, how they can mesh up the data to create other opportunities. So is it the right way to go? I'm fully convinced on that. But the point about risk management, the point about how to manage that and govern that will be a very different journey. So two further definitions there is really about where I want to go then more and about where Standard Charter is in, in this journey and where we are putting our strategy is like, okay, what means banking as a service? Yes, and that's now the definition how we can actually then potentially monetize open banking. It's really about like how you are getting in the way to, you know, bring a platform that you not only create the value to the client, that you enable others to create the value to the client. And then it's a point really about banking services bringing together from different areas, different industries, all of this what you have seen from IDC. It's exactly now the way how to go forward and to think about these different layers between, yes, I need the infrastructure, yes, I need then also a technology platform to, to enable developers. But on the other side, yes, I will need then also a way, the example what I mentioned with bank assurance, the way how I can bring then together the different industries to make actually the customer journey happen. So, and the other thing, yes, banking as a service there, as I said, there will be a different uh, definition if you go to different sources, but in, in a sense they are similar, yes? So banking as a, a platform is more like than the technology foundation, it's then uh, really how to enable this kind of banking engagement with FinTech, with all of the financial services and development experiences around that. So, and, uh, what we are doing there around a couple of things, yes, and I will go more concrete. One thing what we have recently announced, but that's not really a platform to make it also clear there, but you know, it's more like how to enable engagement models. We, we uh, announced recently, um, early this month, uh, where we uh, brought up the FinTech bridge. Yes. So is it now something specific for a bank? Yes. Is it a journey? Who will survive? Will it be more like, you know, FN has also brought up now with Apex, 
even like there's a discussion about oh how they can engage problem statements with fintech solutions and all of this kind of you know bringing together banks are doing this we are doing this so we we announced uh, early last year the SD Ventures very disruptive new business model thinking beyond of industries going there and trying all of this so that's now the way how we want to start to engage now let me go a bit more with my role uh, in the technology area so in our technology strategy yes so there's like we're putting this in a pyramid together there are different levels yes so it's really about like there's not anymore the discussion oh there's business strategy there's technology strategy so business strategy can't work without technology strategy technology strategy can't be successful without business strategy so it's actually one team yeah? so but there's still some differentiation yeah so it's like uh, if you are not solving like our you know foundation that we are secure that everything is stable reliable so these are still the basics of technology so without of that we can't dream about open banking yes? so be also be very clear so this is um, still the, the basics of that but now exactly how we are stretching this farther how we are going this journey farther yes so and you can see yes cloud AI uh, data these are elements going across but also at the peak yes APIs will be relevant how we also think about in an agile manner that we are much closer to the client that we are not in a traditional thinking oh this is today our architecture this is in three years our architecture is more like oh it's changing a lot during this whole journey yes? so and to, to make it more tangible it's like um, when we are coming from a technology perspective and we are saying okay there's three elements who are really really relevant yes so it's like and I will talk about examples people process and architecture so this is coming together how we can enable open banking how we can go in this journey because it's not just oh I have no APIs and then I'm open banking no that's a longer journey to do where we are and starting with the people yes? so as I said it's a mindset where you have also to think about like oh it's not just a mobile first and now I'm done and I'm digitalized so it's really about like um, how to enable the people to think in new open banking manner and uh, principles so what what we have launched um, this year is even also a new brand so we call this access and with the access yes if you go there access.sc.com there you see like a platform how we want to engage in an open banking spirit with developers how we are sharing uh, capabilities how we want to engage them so this is like um, I will say the surface yeah? so it's more like how the platform will enable new kind of um, um, you know experiences but below the access there will be a many many things what we have to do in more to enable this culture and in a bank to bring this forward yes so usually I explain like that yes you will need like a lab yes so physical space like a playground working with the new technologies experiments like when you go across industries how you really develop this actually and also physically with people yes so but also on the other side you will need then an academy so it's like how you upskill the people how you train with the new technologies how to bring this together so if you are going today to banks, uh, many banks, yes, they have a lab, you find this. Yes, they have an academy, you find this. But actually, I haven't found any bank so far who have combined both. So that you really co locate the lab with the academy. And in this manner, now when I'm talking about upskilling people, this is HR. So there's not a curriculum for one year, and so this is never changing. The, the situation with all of these hackathons, with all of this. A, um, labs activities new technologies are coming monthly new this is the way how, how an academy also needs to change yeah so it's always like you know a co-location of both and bringing them in an agile manner to really define the journey of open banking so that's the way how we started with the culture and where we are still in this journey the the next thing is like process yeah so um, if you are starting and the same as I said with the mobile first architecture yes where we are today yes we are still from a technology perspective primarily like a service oriented architecture yes so um, I like this content about the soap in the restroom so because like yes we are still have a lot of soap in, in the in the 
in the company. But it's not now the protocol, is it now REST versus SOAP, or is this now what matters? It's more like how you define all around that. It's more like when we are building today processes, then we are very, very tight on this process, how we want to go with this, you know, now we need now a credit scoring. Okay, for that we are following all of this. We will issue a credit. This in this process. Is this now the way? What I told you when a customer journey is coming, and even more complex from a corporate banking perspective, when a client is going there, then they are doing trade finance. They are going really logistics. They are going really about many, many, many things. Where today we are more like collections of networks. Yes. Yeah? So and. That's a problem when the client will work with us across their journey, how they want to connect their, the services inside. And that's now the way also how we have to reshape the architecture in a sense of and the processes that we are not anymore just designing the processes. We are designing the customer journey. And the customer journey will use our capabilities. That's the way we are go going now. Um, in, in that spirit, like also now, from an architecture perspective, yes, as I said, today we are more in the sense of very traditional um, ESB than there is like, you know, that we are bringing the different layers there. But this is really more an inside out perspective where we are connecting a lot of things. So it's still a valid backbone, no question about that. This is running very solid, uh, you know, executing a lot of these transactions, a lot of the capabilities. But the point in the sense of open banking going out, that's now where SOAP is very different to API spirit, yes, mindset. It's really about like, okay, I have to start with the customer journey. I have to start really about how do I enable the customer? And that's not the definition of the API. Yes, so API definition, I think we can talk about days. It's, it's a long, long history in the box and operating system and all of that. I'm really talking now about the experience APIs when you're connecting this journey. Yeah? So, and in that spirit, yes, we started also more than one year ago with the whole journey. There will be like okay, multiple mountains with multiple dimensions where we have to really think how we are going and climbing up to different summits um, to, to go really on this API journey. Yeah? So, and, to, to make there, yes, are we at the summit? No, yes, so and if you are not just running, if you're also climbing mountains, then you also see, oh, yes, the summit is, is reachable, and I see it, but usually after two hours, you still see the same distance, yes, so that's a, the situation with the summit, so it's still longer the distance as you think, and especially if you're going higher, then you see also it's getting more challenging to get uh, even then farther progressing than it's just to be if you are um, at the starting point. So, but on this journey, really, as I said, it's not just the API itself. It's like the data. It's the AI. It's many capabilities there around to really get into this journey to, to make this uh, as a value proposition. Yes, and then in, in this manner, it's like, um, yes, we created an architecture. It's much more dynamic in a sense. Yes, so we still need core components there. But the key element is like now, we are not thinking anymore in one channel. We are not thinking more in, okay, these are now the, our transaction systems. Yes? So it's more like, in a sense, okay, what capabilities do we have? How we want to interact with different industries? How we want to expose and dynamically our data on different ways? Yes? So it's the whole managing all around that. That's now where the um, architecture is getting much more dynamic in that manner. So um, to, to conclude this is also like, as I said, you not have a robust framework. Yes, I think you saw many, many elements about best practices, how we think, how we go this journey, how we are um, you know, enabling that. But where we are also very strict is like, yes, we are creating some principles how we are making this journey happen. Yes? So, and very key principles on this journey and transformation is really that you're saying, okay, good. Number one is like how we think about, you know, when we are building the system, uh, we want to create now this for scale. Remember I said when we are going in our, you know, huge markets with the highest population like India, China, yeah? so Pakistan and all of this, when you're going all of that, then Indonesia, when you, you see 
um, the situation, how can I really scale? So, and then actually the cost needs to go to zero. Yes, the first transaction is usually expensive because I have to do the whole investment. But if I still keep then humans, if I still keep then too much process between that, what is not automated, what is not optimized, then I will never scale. Yes? So, um, and that's now the one thing, the cost to scale. Yes? The, the other thing is there that you see is like, especially in, when you, as I said, in the open banking, what, you give away control. You, 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 you are in a very different way how your capabilities will be consumed. So if you look digital native, if you look now other generations, how, how long is their attention? Yes, usually it's three to five seconds. So in, in a manner, if maybe when you were long, young or so on, going to a bank and saying, okay, now I need two weeks to get now my approval for a credit card, this will not work anymore. Yes? So you have to go into this market that you have to, uh, to uh, you know, between applying for a credit card and then really issuing it, just two, two minutes, yes, or even less, yes, so to, to have now the attention and so on really give them the right uh, capabilities to go forward. Yes. So then the next thing is also the network effect because otherwise you can't get the scale. Yes. So traditionally banks are really on this model. Yes, we have the relationship managers, the relationship managers working especially with the corporate banks and all of this um, is where where we are acting today. But this means oh I need more people or more branches to reach more people. That can't scale. Yes. So it's the, the point, and that's now a huge opportunity with the open banking, is like how we can create the network effect that actually our clients are our sales. So, and that's now the point with good services, good capabilities, going into this network effect, especially when you get into the clients and so on. That is exactly the way to go. The last one, I think this is still the, the, the biggest journey, what we still have to do. We are, uh, we are not so far there yet. Uh, is yeah, actually, can we learn out of each transaction? But that will be a core principle if you want to be successful in open banking, if you want to monetize that, I, I strongly believe that will be the very proposition there. It's like when you have the capability to learn from every transaction what you're doing and everything what you're executing, then to really say, okay, how can I optimize the system? It's a good example, you know, where we are, where we are today with APIs. Yes, so a regulator is coming and saying, okay, I need this APIs. Now even Swift is coming and saying, okay, they want to standardize the payload and so on. It's everything today so much human based. So then it takes a year to design this API, the resource models going there and then actually using it. And then for the next versioning and managing all of that, yes, you can optimize that. But that's not transformation. Transformation in that way is, oh, can I actually use AI to change all with my API? So can they dynamically change the resource model? We are not there yet, yes, so it's more a dream. But the point is more like really in this manner, in this mindset thinking, that will create the value proposition, how we can really be more dynamic in this world. So based on that, um, uh, I usually can conclude with one of the sentences what I really love from a standard charter is like, good enough will never change the world. Yes. So, and actually, if you are not going in open banking, we will only be good enough. Yes. So that's the reason you have to go, you have to stretch yourself to be more than just good enough. So in that manner, thank you very much. Thank you. Don Christian, Dr. Sebastian. Um, any question? Yes, here. So Dr. Sebastian, what's your thoughts or views on uh, threats associated with open banking? Think of a situation where uh, some fintech or existing banks can use account management APIs and start, the customers start using just fintech, never return to bank website or bank app, but existing bank can do that. So you lost the opportunity where or you can pitch some product or services when customers visit your website. And this threat is happening where already some key fintech players are providing such services using account management APIs. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that's exactly the, the, the usual question what you get. Yes, and exactly this opening up and, you know, you get all this uh, bank bazaar, all this aggregator who are taking exactly now your open APIs, make, uh, bringing this up 
that's the primary usually threat for all the banks. They're saying, oh, now I have full transparency about the cost. Now I will be get compared. Now the data is exposed. Now other aggregator can bring the different accounts together and so on. Yes, so um, it's a valid point. It's a valid point. And you know, this is now from a traditional mindset and thinking it is a threat. Yes, and will I lose some current business? It's a valid, valid point. Yes, so. But the point is on the other side, if I'm just protecting myself and I'm saying, no, I will not let this happen, what will happen with the client? Yeah, so will they still stay with this bank? How long will this uh, bank survive? You know, there's one prediction that they said in the next five years, three quarter of the bank will disappear. So, and now the question is like, okay, do I want to stay on this way? and say, okay, now I'm losing this revenue. No, I, I'm, I don't want to get there really into this aggregator marketplaces and so on. And maybe there's a higher probability that I will be part of this three quarter. Or I'm going this risk and say, oh, my business model will change completely. So the way how I'm doing today money and the way how I will make money tomorrow will be very, very different. Yes, yeah? so because let's give you one example how my mind uh, is thinking is more like, Okay, um, will a bank still be needed in a sense of account and a trust and so on? Or will, you know, I will lose this completely that the aggregator will even take it over? And I think there might be still a role for the future in a sense of can we give trust, can we protect the data, can we do that? Because like other banks, like, or not banks, like, you know, other companies when Facebook is going into this way journey and bringing their own accounts and so on, how much will you trust them? Yes, and I think there will be also a journey where the bank might will have a new opportunity to also uh, bring their values in a different way. Any other question? All right, that concludes uh, today. Big round of applause. Uh, Thank you very much.